Hi everyone, John here from Look Smart Home Inspections right here in New Jersey. And today I wanna to talk to you guys about what are the different home inspections that a home inspector can perform for you? Most everybody here understands what a pre-purchase home inspection is, right? That's, the, that's most of what a home inspector would do, is you hire the home inspector to come into a home to provide a top to bottom evaluation of the home that you're thinking about buying and they present the information accordingly, and then you can make a purchase decision, right? So you understand the defects that exist in that house you're thinking about buying, so you could either go ahead and buy the house, or, or in some cases, maybe not, or maybe even ask the seller for credits or remediation for the things that are found during that pre-purchase home inspection. So that's primarily what a home inspector does, but there's other uh, important home inspection types that a home inspector can help you guys with. And I just wanna go over those so you're familiar with them and maybe uh, you'll find it helpful to understand what else we can do as home inspectors. So the first, first home inspection type I want you, you guys to consider and understand is doing a home inspection on a brand new house. So you're probably saying to yourself, well, John, this is a brand new house. It's right out of the box and I don't need a home inspection, blah, blah, blah. Yes, you do. You need a home inspection. And the builder is going to probably talk you out of it because of some nonsense saying, oh, it's a brand new house and nothing is wrong. Well, you know what? We find plenty of stuff wrong, even in brand new homes. So it's really important to get that brand new home professionally inspected because I guarantee, almost guarantee, that we're going to find some stuff in that home that you didn't even know about that you can bring up to the builder and have them fix before you close on the house. So it's crucially important to do a home inspection on a new home, particularly because these homes are thrown up in record time. Builders throw these houses up because of costs super fast. Like you can turn around, at least in my neighborhood, uh, there's a new development going up. Every time I drive by, there's a new structure there, every single time. So they go up in a week or two and they're rushing. That's the bottom line. And the construction materials are not the best. The subcontractors are rushing around. They have unskilled labor doing a lot of stuff. And that's why you need a new home inspection. So it's super important. So just, just because you're, th you're buying a brand new house doesn't mean that you can't get that house inspected. So as a consumer, you have the right, generally, unless it's written in the contract that you can't, is to get a home inspection on that brand new home. So that's another type of home inspection that a home inspector can do besides uh, the, the crux of our business, which is pre-purchase. But you know, well, there's a good portion of our business that are on brand new homes. And please don't forget uh, and, or forgo that brand new home inspection inspection. The next type of inspection that I want to talk to you guys about is a warranty inspection. So on that brand new house you moved in, you have a year to bring up any deficiencies to the builder and have them fix within that year time frame. So that's a one year warranty. Now that's outside of the main structure, which you'll have a 10 year warranty, but I'm talking about stuff that you can bring up to the builder and have them fix, such as cosmetic defects, problems with doors and windows and plumbing and electrical, things that come up during that first year of ownership. And so that's a warranty inspection, and most home inspectors can help you do a warranty inspection. And of course, that warranty inspection should be done, obviously, before the warranty expires. So when you guys are, are in that house, that brand new house, and you wanna do that warranty inspection, you should have us come in uh, month 10 or 11 to do that warranty inspection so then you can present that information to the builder and have them make remedy on those things. And we find all sorts of things um, on these warranty inspections. So it's important to do, it's money well spent. You're spending a fortune on a new house, you're in the house, and chances are things are going well, but there's, there's probably things that you don't know about there. And a warranty inspection is also important if the builder won't let you do your new home inspection. So if you didn't have a home inspection on the new house when you closed or before you closed, you should definitely do a warranty inspection 
because that's your opportunity to find the things before that warranty expires and to have the builder remedy those issues. So don't forget your warranty inspection. So the warranty inspection is another type of home inspection that a home inspection can help you with and you shouldn't forego that either. That's an important piece of due diligence before your one year warranty expires. The next type of home inspection I want you guys to consider is doing a home inspection in a home that you already own. And I do, I do these, um, and a lot of home inspectors can help you with this. So why would, John, why would I do a home inspection on a house that I already own? Well, the reason why you would do that is because you're, you, a lot of times we're going to find things that you don't know about in the house. Do you, do you know if there's termite damage in the home or wood rot or, or compromised structure or electrical deficiencies, plumbing deficiencies or problems with, you know, different configurations in the home or even structural concerns? I mean, you're living in the house day to day and let's face it, we're all busy and we're not taking a look at our houses. We're not going through our house top to bottom, spending four hours in a home, going through everything to find the problems that exist. And so I do a lot of these and it's important to do them because it gives you an idea of the maintenance that you need to do or the repairs that you need to do down the road. So you can use one of these home inspections in a home that you already own is to come up with a plan to properly maintain and to repair that home over the long term. So that's really, really important to do. And it's, a, it's another piece of due diligence as a homeowner. So usually these are discounted and I offer a discount for this type of inspection. I mean, we're trying to be very competitive with pricing on this uh, type of inspection because it's a home that you already own. You, you live in it and you know a lot of the stuff that's going on in the house, but you don't know everything. And it's really important to keep on top of the maintenance on a home. It's a huge investment. You probably have a lot of built up equity now in this house and you wanna protect that. So one way to do that is to have a home inspection on a home that you already own. So don't forget that type of home inspection. The next type of home inspection that I wanna to talk to you guys about is a pre-listing home inspection. Well, what is a pre-listing home inspection? A pre-listing home inspection is a home inspection that you do on your house that you're gonna put up for sale. And why is that important? Doing a pre-listing home inspection gives you basically a leg up in the marketplace and helps you understand the defects that are gonna come up during your buyer's home inspection. And so why is that important? Is because it gives you the opportunity to fix some of these items that come up before and it makes the transaction a lot cleaner. So if you can take a list of, of say 20 items that the home inspector uh, found during your pre-listing inspection and narrow that list down to say 10 or eight or whatever you can narrow down, it makes the transaction a lot cleaner and a lot quicker and it helps the negotiation and gives the buyer um, more, ability to understand that the house has been well maintained so it gives the buyer more confidence and if you can provide more confidence to the buyer the better the transaction the better the smoother the transaction is going to go so if if, if you do a pre-sales home inspection and the home inspector does find you know some major items at least you have the ability to to understand what's going to come up and have an idea basically to get some contractors in before an understanding of the cost associated with maybe providing a credit to the buyer and so that's really important because the more information that you have about the house that you're going to put on the market the better pricing decisions you can make also. So when the, the real estate agent comes in and does their assessment and, and looks at comparables or comps in the neighborhood and comes up with basically a listing price, they're not really factoring in the condition of the home 
uh, to a great extent. I mean, they, they're real estate agents. They don't really understand if there's major problems with structural, electrical, plumbing, any of the systems in the home, uh, the framing in the house. What is going wrong? They don't really know. So it really pays to do a pre-listing inspection because it gives you an idea of how to properly position that price point in the marketplace for the conditions that exist. So if you're thinking about listing your house, understand that home inspectors can provide a pre-listing inspection before you do that, that you can either keep for yourself as informational purposes, or possibly even provide that uh, to the buyer as another sort of incentive or piece of due diligence. Now you should expect that the buyer is gonna wanna do their own home inspection, of course, but it just shows the buyer that, hey, you know what? I'm trying to give you the best house, the best product that I can, and I went the extra mile and did a pre-listing inspection so I understand how my, you know, the defects that exist in my home before I put it up for, for, for market. So don't forego that pre-listing inspection. It's a piece of due diligence for a potential seller of a home to do. The next type of inspection that I want to talk to you guys about that home inspectors can possibly help you with is commercial inspections. So some of us here, we do smaller commercial inspections. So basically multi-use buildings where you would have a couple of residential units coupled with a couple of businesses is considered a commercial, you know, multi-use type of building. And that's the type of, of, of commercial inspection that a lot of home inspectors here in New Jersey can help you with. I do those as well, and I enjoy doing those as, as well. They're not a huge part of our business here, but it, you know, we do them because it's a necessary um, a thing for a buyer who is buying a, a commercial building uh, that has a couple of apartments and a couple of businesses to understand, you know, what's going on with that. It's not that different, frankly, than, than uh, doing a, a home inspection on a large home. We still approach it the same way. It's, it's really the same type of inspection with a couple of, of differences because obviously you're looking at you know a business you may be looking at an office space which is a little bit different than say you know looking at a living room or family room you know you may be looking at restaurant space which is you know different than you know the typical home inspection but those of us with experience in this small commercial end can definitely help you with this type of thing so don't think that just because you're buying a small commercial uh, building with, with multi-use that you can't have a good home inspection because you absolutely can. So don't forego, forego that uh, if you're thinking about buying an investment you know, in a multi-use type of thing. And also a multi-family home here in, in New Jersey, we can inspect multi-family homes, no problem. You know, we do, I do three, four family homes all the time. And there's a lot of them here in New Jersey, especially in the urban areas. So um, don't think that a home inspector also can't help you, you know, with your two, three or four family, uh, you know, uh, residential investment property also and they're inspected just like single family homes are we take our time we do top to bottom home inspection on those too the you know those home inspections are a little bit obviously more costly and more time consuming uh, for us uh, the home inspector because they're just larger and there's a lot of different systems and uh, you know units to look at but just, you know, don't think that we can't help you with that because here in New Jersey, home inspectors can definitely help you uh, with that uh, investment property, two, three, four family home as well. So I hope you guys found this a little bit educational regarding the different types of home inspections that home inspectors can perform. We're not just, you know, sort of pigeonholed into that pre-purchase home inspection. We can do a lot of different things. Experienced home inspectors can basically inspect any type of building and any type of scenario um, that you can throw at us. So upcoming here, I have some defects that were recently found in homes. I know you guys, uh, you know, some of you uh, have told me that you enjoy looking at some of the things that we find, you know, as far as the defects and problems here in New Jersey. So here's some defects that were recently found doing homes in New Jersey. Thank you for watching. I certainly appreciate the support. And if you ever have any questions or anything, just reach out to me. It's John from Look Smart Home Inspections right here in New Jersey. 
listing agent tells me that I can't come and inspect the basement in this house that I have today, and I tell her that it's my job to inspect the basement, I'm going down to the basement. And when I come down here into this room of the basement, this is why she doesn't want me to come down here. So we have <laughs> definitely some water intrusion here to deal with for sure. But keep your eyes open, guys. One of the important aspects of a home inspection is to determine if the attic ventilation is adequate. And many times the attic ventilation is inadequate, especially in an older home. So here we have soffits on the outside of the house. So there is ventilation on our lowest area of the roof under the eave or the soffits called soffit vents. But you have this insulation that's tucked in tight right above those soffit vents. So air is not going to be able to get in here at all. So this is something that's important. We want open soffits if they are if the house is equipped with soffit ventilation. So air is gonna come into the soffits and then exit at the top of this roof, which should have a ridge vent. So we want soffit vents coupled with a ridge vent, and that would really greatly improve the attic ventilation in the attic. It is so hot up here. We do have these gable vents, which are okay. I mean, look, that's gonna be okay. We have another gable vent down the line here, but we really want to improve the ventilation so you can actually store something in this attic so the roof covering doesn't prematurely age. You want to get, you know, less, you know, about roughly five to six years lower uh, life expectancy on a roof covering than have it this hot, you know, in your attic space. So attic ventilation is crucially important. And if we look up here, we don't have any ridge venting, so there's no top of the attic ventilation either. And so that's why air is so, so stagnant in this attic space. So we're going to recommend to the client who's down uh, below, actually, he's working with a contractor downstairs today, um, you know, to make some renovations of this house. However, we need to improve the ventilation by the installation of soffit vents coupled with the installation of a properly configured ridge vent here and that would greatly improve the attic ventilation now there's going to be some talk back about whether we need these gable vents you know what i like gable vents i think they're helpful i think they're useful so i'm going to just say leave them in place there might be some pushback by some of you guys regarding these gable vents but you know what to my opinion, the more ventilation we have in the attic, the better we're going to be and the, li the longer life we're going to have out of our roof covering. So attic ventilation, super, super important. Home inspectors, we have to look at these duct, uh, these plumbing pipe penetrations where they exit the roof. Here you can see daylight and that's just not the daylight coming through the pipe because of the sunlight. That's actually daylight around the pipe where it exits the roof. And we wanna make sure that there's no issues here. So this generally has to do with a boot flashing that's deteriorated on the outside of this house. So generally that's a rubber boot flashing uh, and that's gonna get brittle over the seasons, the hot and the cold cycles. And we want this piping nice and tight. But if you see here around this piping, you see the, um, the water staining around the pipe. So this one is not, uh, going to be watertight. So these are really important aspects where the where the waste pipes, uh, where the ventilation pipes actually exit the roof uh, for the plumbing system, as well as any other pipe penetrations or chimneys that penetrate the roof. This is super important, and a lot of times we'll see water staining just like this. So look for this if you're thinking about buying a home. Look for that daylight. Why do we have daylight? Because we have a failing flashing. There should be no daylight right there. Okay, garage foundation wall. We have negative grade on the front of this house that's directing water, and that water is seeping through. We have a dry lock sealer on the walls, right? Dry lock, you know, it's touted as, you know, a good thing. I don't particularly like dry, dry lock because it does, one, it does two things. One, it actually locks in the water inside the block so it can't penetrate through. 
and it's never 100%, so you still have some seepage. And the dry lock acts as a food source for this mold right through here, right? So this is mold, and it's probably a mold called cladosporium. And that mold loves this dry lock. It loves to eat the paint. So now we have perfect conditions. We have moisture, and then we have a food source. So this mold is just gonna continue to get worse and worse over time. And if you have a mold remediation company come in, they can, they can, they can remove this, absolutely. They'll make this wall look all pretty. However, if you don't solve the moisture penetration problem, that is just a stopgap. It's just a, uh, you know, it's, it, it's just like a Band-Aid. And this is gonna come back again. So you gotta be careful with mold. It can be hazardous. Those of us with good immune systems, you're likely to be okay, but compromised people, older folks, younger children, this is nasty. You don't want this in a house that you're thinking about buying. You don't wanna move in first. You want this problem solved and the root cause of the problem solved for sure. We shouldn't have any holes in a fire rated ceiling. So if you have a garage like this and there's living space above it, so here above this garage is a living room. And then we have these open holes. I guess what happened was that they were installing these garage door openers and they cut open these holes here and here and then back here in the back of the garage, they were probably fixing a plumbing issue. Great, I like that, fix it of course. But this, these holes should be properly fire rated with drywall, right? Tape and then, um, you know, spackle, tape first and then spackle twice, right? Because we want this to be properly fire rated, right? If a garage fire were to establish itself, we don't want it to have a quick chase right up to the living room. So fire rating of garage ceiling where there's living space above is a must do. And this is not a big deal but don't neglect these things, it's for safety for sure. Here we have our good friend, that mold again, all throughout the basement here. So this is the front of the house, negative grade on the front of the house, water's being directed towards the front of the house, and this is what we get. And it's, it's actually a good thing that we have a walking area between the finished basement here and the structure on the foundation walls. If this, structure was right against these walls, a home inspector may not see this, right? Um, we could only visibly see what's, what's open and accessible. And so this is actually a good thing for the client to understand that there is a mold problem for sure in this house that's gonna have to be corrected. And the only really way to know that in this main area of the finished basement is, it be, is because there is a little walkway here. Right, so that's actually a good thing. We can get in here and actually look at the foundation walls, look at the base of the walls, and we can see the mold that's developing. These deck rails here are unsafe. So part of our job as a home inspector is to obviously check deck guardrails for safety. So a deck guardrail should support a point load of 200 pounds on its top rail. So I like to give this a good shake a -roo. and what happens here is it's just, I could almost just push that over with light pressure. And we're right, we're high. I mean, we're, we're a story up for sure. I mean, that would, uh, that would smart if somebody would, uh, you know, go over the side of the deck. So this is something that's very important. So don't be afraid to put a little pressure. If you're buying a house, put a little pressure on your deck rail. See if they're nice and sturdy and taut. They should be really strong. So you know when you have that housewarming party that nobody gets injured. So this is definitely gonna need correction. As home inspectors, one of the things that we really need to look at is the roof covering because roofs are expensive and everybody who buys a house wants to know the age <coughs> and how many years left um, we have in a roof and I gotta be honest this roof doesn't really have much time if any left You can see this damage here. This roof is very very brittle comes right apart Comes right apart. Look at that and we have all these little surface cracks right through here So our asphalt mat is getting very dried out and brittle So we're really close to be needing a roof. You can see how thin that material is and another thing you can do is just kind of give this 
rub some of that material off. It shouldn't rub off this easily. So this granular material protects this asphalt mat from ultraviolet rays. And if that is coming off very, very easily, you know you're looking at an older roof for sure. So a roof generally has a life expectancy of about 20 years, at least a roof like this. And there's some people in the marketplace, they'll, they'll say that, no, you should get 40 years out of a roof like this. Well, you know what? That's nonsense. And if you think that roof is warranted for 40 years, you get that warranty and let that, let that transfer over. So if your seller's telling you that this roof is guaranteed for 40 years, get that warranty and see if that warranty will transfer over to you in a roof that is in this condition. I guarantee that there is no guarantee or warranty on this roof remaining. So always look for older roofs. Roofs are expensive to install. Um, and it's, 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 it's an important piece of a home inspection is to determine the age or the life expectancy remaining of a roof. On this house here, we have a downspout that's missing and a downspout that's missing. So why is that important? That seems pretty simple and obvious and not a big deal, right? Well, it can be a very big deal because here, when, that, when these gutters drain during really heavy rain or even moderate rain, that water is just gonna end up sit right next to our foundation wall. So we have gallons and gallons of water coming off our steep pitched roof into the gutter system and ending up right here close to the exterior of this house. And then if we look here, what do we have? We have this planting area, right? We have a planting area here, gravel. The gravel may help for drainage a little bit, but all our water is gonna end up, any water that ends up here, it's just gonna go seep right down to the foundation. That is no good. I tell you the truth, I don't like these planting walls. When I see these, I really want you to remove them because we want to develop a nice positive picture grade away from the exterior foundation walls. So what happens here? The wind-driven rain comes here. We have the two downspouts that are missing going to put water here, and the water's got nowhere to go other than to seep down right close to your foundation wall. How good is that? It's not good at all. So this is something that I don't like to see in a home. People like this, they don't really understand the problem that this kind of configuration causes, and it's a big problem. So if you end up keeping something like this and you wanna put your plants, don't oversaturate this because we're so close to the foundation wall, and we frankly, we have no ability to drain anywhere. Very, very important, guys. Always look for drainage problems on the outside of a house that you're thinking about buying. Here we have an ancient air conditioning unit right here, and I don't even have to look at the date to know this thing is past its 15 year life expectancy. So if you go and buy a house and you're looking at an air conditioner and it looks like this, and it's got this much rust and uh, this much wear on it, I do want you to know the chances are that air conditioning is not gonna work. It's not gonna be functional. So here we did try to put on the air conditioner uh, and it's not operational, of course. So both this air conditioner out here, which is most likely an R22 unit for sure, and the inside evaporator coil are gonna have to be replaced at kind of a great expense. So make sure you're looking at those exterior air conditioners. And even if you don't know how to put a date on the uh, unit exactly, you can certainly look at the condition of the unit and determine uh, basically its age. It's not often, and I do my best really not to call decks unsafe or hazardous, but here we have really what is an unsafe deck. We see over here, I don't know if you guys can see it, but on the left side of this two-story deck, four by four posts only, four by fours, really we want to see six by six down to proper structure. This portion of the deck at these corners has a significant slope to the left side. And the reason why that's happening is because both of these deck ledgers on the top and the bottom are pulling away from the structure of the house. So the deck is moving to the left, causing an unsafe condition. And there's gaps underneath the, both of these ledgers where they attach to the home. So when we see deck failures, typically the mechanism of failure 
is where the deck ledger attaches to the house. So if we, has a, if we have a deck ledger that's not a properly attached to the home, that's significant safety hazard. And we couple that with these very, very poor supports here down to our structure. And that, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. So I'm gonna show you a couple more things. Let's get a closer look. This is the connection of the deck ledger to the structure of the house in this deck. And we see about three to four inches right there with all rotted wood in here. So this is what's holding up our deck, which is basically nothing along this left side. This is a significant safety hazard, like I explained before. So the reason why this happens is lack of bolting through the structure of the home and an improper, or actually in this case, missing deck ledger flashing. Now a deck ledger flashing prevents water from getting in between that deck ledger and the structure of the home, causing damage. So once that structure gets damaged, there's really no meat or no structure gonna hold that ledger to the house. So this is a significant safety hazard for this deck. This is the bottom portion of the deck and we see our deck ledger attachments right here. Very, very rusted, poor condition right there, right there. So we have this rusting metal and that's gonna cause ultimately a deck failure. We have rusting joist hangers, rusting joist hanger, rusting joist hanger. And if we look under here, this left side of the deck, we have another gaping hole between the deck ledger and the structure of the home. So none of this is good, none of this is safe, and uh, I'm gonna recommend this deck be replaced for safety concerns. This is a walkway, and we see how much that walkway, that section of walkway was heaved by these tree roots. The tree is no longer there, that's been removed, but we see that this is very, very high and creates a significant tripping hazard. So the issue here is that when you go by this house, this walkway becomes your problem. It's not the town's problem, it's generally your problem. So make sure you're looking at this walkway. And frankly, we're pretty far away from the home. The home is set downward. And if you're, if you're just going in the driveway and you're not, you're not walking around the exterior of the house in all areas, you're likely to miss this. So make sure you take a look at the walkways when you're thinking about buying a home. It's nothing to ignore because this issue becomes your issue when you buy the house. Here we have siding touching grade or actually below the grade, making this sill plate in this garage very vulnerable to water damage, insect damage, and wood rot. So that's when you look at a house and you see this kind of thing where our siding is below the ground, that's an indication that we really need to take a look at the sill plate beyond this area to make sure that that sill plate is in good condition. So we don't really wanna see this. This makes it very vulnerable uh, to those issues. And this is wood earth contact. And trust me when I tell you nothing good happens when we see this siding below the level of the soil. When we see a chimney flashing like this, so this is a step flashing, and there's no counter flashing over the step. However, this step flashing is so small that there's no way that flashing is gonna be successful at keeping water out of that intersection where the chimney uh, meets the structure of the home. So when we go in the attic, we're definitely gonna be looking at that gable end and trying to see if there's any water penetration. And I can almost guarantee that we're gonna see water penetration right in that area where that poorly designed and installed chimney flashing is. So a chimney flashing is a very important piece of flashing because it helps prevent water from getting behind and around the chimney, which is vulnerable in most homes for water penetration. I asked the seller here in this basement how many times that they've had water infiltration. And they asked me, well, how do I know that the basement ever had water infiltration? Well, I say that the carpet's removed, the tack strips are rusted, the nails. We have staining on the uh, paneling inside of the basement. We have what appears to be mold growth right here. And the bottom of our basement paneling is warped right here. So we can see that the bottom of the paneling is water damaged. So we definitely had water in this basement.
Uh, the question is how often do we get water in this basement, not if we get water in this basement.